Hi, I'm Tim Massa with Brian Govberg at Watchbox New York. We have a special treat for you today. Passionate, provocative, erudite, and sincere, William Messena is an original, and he's the star of today's show. William, welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, of course, on Perpetually Patek, we love to talk about how each of us became passionate about the brand. And I'm curious about your formative experiences with these watches and how you came to admire them in the first place. I grew up in Geneva, so in Geneva you cannot really escape Patek Philippe. You know, you have that big building in the center of town, the big clock. Um, so growing up, you don't really pay attention, and then you start paying attention. And Patek was the brand. My father had a Patek. A lot of my father's friends had Patek. So at one point you get interested in brand. So you're sort of steeped in the culture of the region, and you know, when you're in Geneva, Patek Philippe is sort of the apex of horology. It's the apex, and at the time it was basically the only brand out there. There were not so many watch stores in the early 80s in Geneva. Now what's fascinating to me is that the 80s were considered to be a relatively challenging time for traditional watchmakers, but Patek actually found its groove in the era of luxury watches. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how those watches were regarded back in the 80s? I think back in the 80s, the advertising of the watches were very important to the image that you know people had of it. It wasn't so much about what the watch was doing, it was more about what the watch was projecting. Um, the, the whole advertising of you, you don't have a Patek Philippe, you're keeping it for the next generation, it exists. At the time, was, it was more about you have a Patek Philippe on your wrist, you're giving a statement. Yes, I have the most prestigious watch brand on my wrist. And I think that was kind of this Rolls Royce aspect to the brand that was uh, fascinating people. Why is it the best? People didn't really know why, but a, a lot of people were buying them. And so for a lot of folks, something like the 1985 3919 would have been their first encounter with Patek Philippe. Uh, this was not a complicated watch, but it became something of a classic in its day. You've spoken about this before. Do you think it's underrated now? Oh, definitely. The 3919 has really set the stage for Patek Philippe. Clou de Paris, bezel, nice porcelain dial, very simple black numerals. It was kind of the quintessential Patek, you know, like the little black dress. Um, and that was the watch you could wear with everything. The 3919 was a first point of contact for many 1980s enthusiasts who were encountering the brand uh, initially. But a lot of the veteran collectors at the time, they wanted pocket watches. Pocket watch was the only, the only watches that were interesting collectors at the time. I think, I think Antiquam did the first auction of uh, wristwatches in 1980, and it was a big success. Uh, but I think most of it, the, the majority of the watches were pocket watches. And then there, to illustrate, you had a wristwatch. Up to even you know, the late 90s in New York, you go to a Sotheby's auction or a Christie's auction, it was mostly pocket watches. And so today, the kind of sort of uh, horological conservative who would have been a pocket watch guy in the 80s, today maybe that's exactly the right kind of person to rehabilitate the 3919 and make it, um, you know, a focus of younger collectors again. Because it's smaller, it's traditional, it's very simple, it's not a complicated watch. Uh, but you think that it's sort of, uh, it has value to today's collector who might be overlooking it. I, I think it does because um, people, with, people that were really into watches in the 80s were gravitating towards the, the newer things, which was the 3940, maybe the 3970. And, um, and in between those two relatively expensive watches, you had back the 3919 and I think the 3996, which was the, you know, the la latest reference 96, basically. Uh, and it was also a 34 millimeter watch. So the, 30, the 3996, people thought it looked kind of dated. And the 3919 was the watch that was advertised. It was the watch that looked very classical. Um, you had the Ellipse collection that was also there, but the Ellipse was kind of a statement that you know, not everybody was ready to do. Um, and the 3919 was, I won't call it a bar mitzvah watch, but nearly could have been a bar mitzvah watch. <laughs> Ironically, it was priced at less than $5,000 at the time. Yes, yes. And so was the 3996. Yeah. And then it would jump to uh, a 3940. There was no in-between. Well, the collections back then were a lot smaller. So, I mean, you just didn't have, 
as many options. And But collectors also didn't own as many wristwatches back then. If somebody had anywhere between two and five Pateks, you would have said that they had a lot. This is why Patek was very smart. If you look at it, um, they, for many years, a lot of brands looked and say, I'm going to sell one watch to somebody and this watch is going to be for the rest of their life. And Patek were the first one to recognize, no, I'm going to sell them one watch and then they're going to buy another watch and then they're going to buy another one. I'm, I'm going to make a collector of you. Uh, and I think this education of making you a collector was uh, intrinsically very Patekish, and nobody else was doing it. And nobody else thought of it. And that's why they started introducing those references in the 90s to be able to have people do steps. You know, I go from a 39.19 to uh, maybe a 50.35, mm -hmm. and then I can go to a 39.40, and each step. Well, that's makes where they were a genius with the. When they came out with the 5035, the annual calendar complication, that's where it was genius of them, right? Because they were able to, to speak to the client that didn't want to spend as much as a perpetual. And it also offered a stepping stone to say, hey, perhaps you're not ready for a perpetual just yet. Here, try an annual. And then, by the way, if you want a you know, ultra thin sort of perpetual down the line, you're not buying the same watch. When, when the annual came out, when the 5035 came out, I was, I think, in 96 or 97. Mm -hmm. 96. Um, I, I remember I was, I was not there yet to be able to afford it, but it was a goal that was possible. The 3940 was extremely expensive. Uh, maybe buying it used, but you don't really want to buy your first watches used because you're not very familiar with, with, with the references. And, and the 3970 was already at least a, a $65,000 watch, um, maybe a little bit less, but it was unaffordable to most of us. So the 5035 was this watch that was like, oh yeah, I can attain that. I can graduate from the 3919 and, and get into that annual calendar. And then you have a complication that is very easy to explain to people. And it's interesting because that era, the 80s and the 90s, that was sort of the sunset of Henri Stern's direct involvement with Patek Philippe uh, and the dawn of Philippe Stern's involvement. There was also the move toward complicated watchmaking that started really with the 150th anniversary in 1989. Could you comment a little bit about that? Because it really just exploded entering the 90s. So in the, the last 90 years, the, the company has been run by four people, basically. and and. I think when they reach that stage, when they start running the company, they basically bring this impulse to the collection. And uh, Philippe Stern did that. It's very clear that the, the 3970, the 3940, or even the 3919, uh, or even the Nautilus to a certain extent, were watches that he wanted and that he brought to the market. And at 20 years later, we, we're going to see a different shift in that aesthetic or that demand from the son who arrives and has different appreciation of what watch should be. And the, the approach to the watchmaking has been evolving with the leader of the pack. There's no mm -hmm. question about it, the Patek. And it's very consistent because you have only four leaders in the last 100 years, basically. But I think that, that that's created a sense of continuity even between the product lines, right? So, because they're taking what has existed or from the past, and then when they come out with something different, you know, they're changing what came before, but not completely. You know, so no different than Mr. Stern Thierry transitioning from the 5970 to the 5270, right? Meaning both sort of iconic key references that each was responsible for, but still you see that line going all the way, all the way back, all the way to the now. Now it's fascinating because there was so much change in the 90s. For the first time, we had mass production of compound complications, torpion, retrograde perpetual calendar, minute repeater, all at once, split seconds chronograph perpetual calendar, so many innovations in watches that were not physically large, which was impressive, but one that was physically enormous might have been the design classic of the 90s from Patek, and that was the 1998-5070. Has that become an underrated watch now? Have we come full circle? Well, it's the 25th anniversary of that watch this year. In a month, it would be the 25th anniversary, and I happen to be wearing one today. Um, yeah, the 5070 was huge when it came out in, in more than one way. First chronograph that Patek had made in 40 years, maybe less, 30 years. It was um, still Alemania movement, inspired by the 2512, which was this military watch uh, 
pseudo military watch that nobody had remembered. And he, he made a statement. A lot of people remember that. Uh, funny enough, he came out the same year as IWC released the Portuguese chronograph. Same size, but very thin bezel. Uh, this one is a thick bezel, stepped. And in terms, of, um, in terms of aesthetic, you have a smaller dial because of smaller movement. You have, so they need to concentrate on a lot of different printing around the, uh, the two sub-dials to make it look big. And we looked at it and we were like, wow, what is this? This is so not Patek Philippe. And we should mention that at the time, you know, this is a 3970. This was the perpetual calendar chronograph. It's 36 millimeters in diameter. The 5004 was the same size. The only watch that was comparably sized to a 5070 in 1998 was maybe a Panerai? There wasn't a whole lot out there. It was uh, the Offshore, obviously, that had come out five years earlier. Mm -hmm. um, the Panerai, but Panerai was bigger and thicker. Um, and the IWC... Um, um, and, and obviously, I'm, I'm assuming that Patek knew or uh, sensed that the datograph would come a year later and maybe in a certain way had to bring their own chronograph. I think it was a success. I, it took me maybe a year, a year and a half to get one. I, I think I had to save the money to get it. I bought it around the corner from here uh, at Vempe. But I, I, you know, at the time, you could still get a watch. Um, and I think a lot of people were shocked by the size. It was very big. And when we're talking about Panerai and we're talking about Royal Oak Offshores as comparables, you got to remember the 5070 was a dress watch. As big as it was, it was a dress watch. And there was a huge gap between, I guess, the late 60s phase out of the 1463 and the arrival of the 5070. And it was scarce, maybe 250 watches per metal per year. Yeah, so the theory was that Patek had to make them by 250 or 500. But at the time, they, they weren't sure that they could make 500, a production of 500, so they would make 250, and then if it's sold, they'll make another 250. So I, I think they made maybe a thousand of those, maybe a little bit less, 750. Um, the rarest is the P, maybe the 5070 mm -hmm. P, which was the final iteration yeah, of the watch, which came out when 2010, uh, and they made what, maybe 250 of those, 500. Yeah, very, very few. I'd be shocked if they made even 250. It had such a short run, even less than 200 wouldn't shock me. I, I think the 5070 for me is, is all about aesthetics. You either, you're gonna like the version you like, but if you're gonna buy it as an investment, you want one of the Saatchi gallery pieces from the London exhibition, mm -hmm. or you want that platinum watch because it is yeah. such they a They haven't standard. moved in 10 years. Now, I mean, I don't wanna go into the pricing thing. I, I, for me, I mean, it's one of the few references where I can't quite understand why the price has not moved yeah. because it's a contemporary aesthetic and look Right, so it's it's not like you're wearing a watch that looks like it's a watch from 50 years ago. I mean, yeah. it's as relevant, it's almost even more relevant today than it was when it first came out. And as you mentioned, like the price really hasn't budged too much. The, the P has gone up and down dramatically just based on, I would say, like availability and somebody looking for the piece. But ultimately, it's one of those watches where I can't quite understand why the price hasn't popped. The I 5970 think has. I, the 5970, well, the 5070 announced the 5970. I think uh, they, they wanted to be too much with the 42 millimeter, and they came back and they were like, uh, for the 5970, we'll we, need to, yeah, we need to do 40. Going from 36 to 42 was way too much. Um, but I think what killed the 5070 in terms of appeal is the 5960. Yeah, and that's an interesting piece too, because there's a watch that really does try to be all things to all people. Does it succeed? It did for a long time. Um, I, when it came out, I, I, this I remember very well. The Patek was very nervous. That was in 2006. And Patek was extremely nervous about that watch. You could sense it at Basel that they weren't sure. They were asking for feedback from everybody. What do you think? What do you think? And I had the, the motor counter thing was kind of weird, but at the same time, interesting, colorful the gray dial, and then you have this weird color thing. Uh, to me, it kind of look a bit clownish uh, in certain ways, and, but people were on fire about it. Everybody talked about the 5960 when it came out. And I think that's why um, Patek you know, went crazy <laughs> producing that watch, um, because th there was a huge um, demand for it. People were really into it. 
I think the, the 5960 is an interesting watch because they did massively mass produce it. And of the watches we've talked about, 3919, the 5070, the 5960, each one has what could be described as a flaw that leads to it being underappreciated. The 3919 is too small. The 5070 is perhaps not automatic, not equipped with a date, a little bit eclipsed by more complicated recent references. And the 5960, they just made a million of them. How do, how do you as a collector kind of push back against these headwinds and find value? I don't. I buy what I like and everything else, you know, goes the other way. You know, sometimes I like something that is very rare. Sometimes I like something that is very popular. I, I, I don't look at watches so much as the value. I like as the enjoyment of it. You know, I buy something, will I wear it for two or three years? and then sell it, it's possible. Will I keep it for 20 plus years? Also possible. If, if I was focused on value when I buy a watch, I would be stuck with, um, I would be stuck with 3940s and uh, 3970s and that's it, you know? You, you can, you have to take a risk. You don't buy any watch thinking about that. Or if you do, you, you're doomed. You're really doomed, I think. Now, Brian, you were talking before about the kind of nascent online communities that grew around Patek around the turn of this century. Uh, William, you were there at the time. Yeah, I was moderating the Patek forum on Time Zone. In the early 2000s, there was definitely a need because Time Zone was growing so much out of the forum, the main forum, that there was a need, uh, and the brand were also expressing that, to, um, to have people go in specific brand-related forum as the questions. So it would be easier also to track answers and, and to um, archive everything. And uh, I was asked to, in, I think 2000, I was asked to moderate the Patek Forum. And the reason I was is because I knew maybe three references. <laughs> it's not like I was the biggest you know, Rolex ex uh, Patek expert. And uh, immediately you had, uh, it was very Asian focused. So it was very much Asian leading the conversation, Hong Kong collectors leading the conversation, Singapore collectors. And the, uh, the importance was the 3970. The, they were obsessed with the 3970 and the, and the 5004. These were the two very important questions that people had. And then it was sealed watches. You know, that was the beginning of the craze mm -hmm. for, should I have my watch sealed? Should I keep it sealed? Should I keep it in my safe sealed? Uh, should I wear it? Um, and, and it was really ridiculous. You had guys that were showing the watch collection and it was all those plastic bags and I will try them on the wrist. In the bag. W with a bag, yeah. Well, I think that this was the, that was the turning point in which the, the notion that they were almost investments sort of came into focus. The 3970 was a 14-year-old watch, which the shelf life of a reference max is 10 years, max. And Patek was kind of pushing it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they were maybe at 4,000 pieces. The 3970 was going to die soon in a way and to be replaced. Um, and, and I think people were looking at it being like, oh, this is going to be such an important reference. I have to keep it because I don't know what's going to come next. And what, was, uh, what they were looking at were those annual calendars. Um, and, and in 2000 was the year of the, um, the world time. Mm -hmm. which I think the reference at the time was the 5110. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, so it was the year of the 5110, and uh, people thought that maybe Patek was going in di different directions. So they were holding 3970s. I remember I did an interview with Thierry and his dad in, uh, in Basel in 2004, and all the questions that I got, because the audience were asking, feeding me questions, was about the 3970 and what was happening to the 3970. And they were obsessed with the 3970s, like people have been obsessed with the uh, 5711. You know, mm -hmm. there, there was this obsession around that, the, the perpetual chronograph, because they thought it would be gone soon. Um, and, and to a certain extent, they were right. The, the 5970 comes at 40 millimeter. And for the Asian market, it was not really an easy watch to wear. No, I mean, I think that the, the 5970 was probably more suited to the American market at the time when it, when it launched. But so it's 2000, you're moderating the Patek Forum. It's probably the only place on the internet that if you're passionate about Patek that you can come in and you can learn. You know, I would say Instagram doesn't exist, Facebook doesn't exist. There's really, you know, 
not many other blogs or anything else. When would you say there was a transition that the entire world really adopted the forum and that Americans started coming in and it became truly international? Americans, so uh, Americans are very practical in certain ways. You know, they don't want to talk in absolute. They, uh, early collectors, I think, 20 years ago, early collectors on the internet were more into how do I, f how do I set my moon phase? How do I, you know, they, they, there was two issues. The issue was importing a watch. Mm -hmm. How do I import a watch in the U.S.? Um, uh, pricing, obviously, and, and I think that was very important to Americans was the fact that there was, up to the 90s, a big price difference between Europe and the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the internet, especially forums, kind of close that loophole. Like, I think the brands realize, and Patek in particular, that you need to have a universal price or you're going to have really problems in different markets. And that was, the American was so practical into this rather than uh, talking so much about design, aesthetic, or, or movements it was not so important to American collectors. They also, the. The most important thing to a collector on the internet back then was I buy a watch, I post it, and I want to have some uh, feedback. You know, it mm -hmm. was kind of like the Instagram of the time because people will come, ask a question, buy the watch, come back, and, and basically assert that they bought the watch. So there was a, a pre-sell post and a post-sell post. And, and what's very interesting here is the fact that um, the brands was never involved in it. The, you, you, the, the brands... Uh, at least Patek wasn't. Some brands were, but Patek wasn't. They would let the flow do. It never came to me and told me to pull out a story or, or, to, or to stop somebody from talking, which I kind of appreciate. Um, I was not always positive about Patek. I was very critical sometimes about Patek um, and some of the choice, aesthetic choice, you know. And, but never I was um, pressured to do anything um, that the brands wanted. And, and this I'm... I'm I respect them for this, the, the, the fact that there was no, that, no hands on this. You can do what you want. Uh, and, and they let me you know, visit them, and um, I would see them at Basel, and um, I was always very well um, welcomed at the booth. So now, as you've moved into the role of a sort of designer and quarterback for your own brand, uh, Masena Lab, you curate the history of many different brands and channel some of those themes in the watches you design. Could you talk a little bit about how a vintage Patek Philippe has influenced some of the designs that you've brought to market so far? Um, yeah, sure. I can. Uh, I, I did a watch with Raoul Pages. Uh, we released it in October, and we call it the the, the Magraph, which stands for Masena Graph. But actually, it's a uh, uh, it's a player word on a watch that Patek did uh, for a retailer in Berlin called Margraf. And uh, they made this beautiful Bauhaus style Calatrava. Um, and um, it was a pièce unique. It was sold at Christie's maybe 15 years ago. And I kind of took that watch, I took that dial, and I kind of, you know, I, I changed it. But my inspiration was that Calatrava. Um, I think Patek has a huge catalog of beautiful dials. And, and beautiful uh, cases uh, that, you know, is there to be exploited, basically. Now, also, the movement of the Magrav is important, too, because it's channeling a very specific reference that you had in mind. Yes, so it was, um, uh, Patek did that watch, um, did an observatory chronometer for this uh, American lawyer called J.B. Champion and in 1952. Um, and the watch was based on a Valjou, Valjou 21. And they, they, they took away the chronograph function and they made this uh, super high-end, extremely precise chronometer watch. Um, and I really want to channel that. So what we did with Raoul is we took uh, 7750 base chronograph, we pulled out the chronograph and we did um, the um, the bridges like the VZ, uh, the VZZ. And we're trying to make it a very precise watch too, a chronometer watch. Uh, and that was, again, an homage to Patek. So I took two elements of Patek from two different eras, the 1930s with the Magraph and Margraph, and the 1950s with the JB Champion. Now I have some questions because at this point, you have lots of experience to share, and I would love to know if you were speaking to a collector who is looking to get into Patek Philippe 
from the 80s to the present, the, sort of the era that spans your career, what watches would you recommend as essential pieces that define Patek in those eras? Um, to me, no question, 3940. Um, I, I think the 3940 with the 240 movement, first of all, the 240 movement is the most important movement of Patek Philippe since the quartz crisis. You see it everywhere. I mean, to a certain extent, the 5110 has it. Um, there's even a Nautilus that has it. The 5712, right, has, has the, you had um, many references that has a 240. 240, I, I just learned a few months ago that the 240 was uh, made by this guy who worked for Universal Genève before. He worked on the Calibre 66. I don't know if you knew that. Um, and then he went to work for Patek in the 70s and they made the, they released the Kelly 240 with a, um, I think with an ellipse, maybe a, a 35, 36, I'm not sure of the references. Um, and the 240 is when Patek, in the middle of the crisis, was like, we are still sticking to mechanical watches. We are making thin watches because the market wanted thin watches, and we are gonna add complication to it. And I think that was very bold. Here's a risk. Here's a huge risk. And the first complication was the 3940. Um, in terms of uh, aesthetic, the 3940 is kind of the perfect perpetual calendar, you know, 36 millimeter, um, very easy to read, very beautiful dials. They, they, they still made those dials the old fashioned way to a certain extent. I, I think later maybe the, the, the last series of 3940. They feel were, nouveau vintage. Yes, it's like a, they're very it's neo like vintage. A, it's like a modern exactly. watch, but yeah. it's with vintage vibes. It, it, you know, it's, it's a lot of people believe that 3940 uh, is kind of the beginning of the modern Patek. Mm -hmm. But it's very much that transition on that reference that I think is important. Now they're getting up in, in, in the, they're starting to get, you know, gain a lot of um, following. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's still room here. And I think a young collector who loves Patek, should look into that. It's not crazy expensive. And then again, if you want to go back further, uh, as I mentioned before, all those form uh, watches from the 50s, they're super inexpensive. You know, anything with a 990 movement is, is a gift today. Top hats, Marilyn, bananas, it's um, manta rays. All, all those watches are, are very unique, have great stories, and, um, and people should look at them. Now, because you are a watch designer now, you're not just a collector, yeah. you are quarterbacking the design of a lot of watches. Let's say a dream opportunity arose and Patek Philippe says, you've passed the bar, you know, you've put in your time, we're gonna let you oversee the design of a Patek watch within reason. What kind of watch would that be? Um, you know, the, my favorite this watch- This is like the AP contest, by the way. <laughs> AP contest, It may, it may yeah. happen. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> it's the audition now, there we go. <laughs> um, I, I love the 5370. Um, I would have loved to redo the dial, and maybe the case on that watch. It, it's a beautiful watch, it's my favorite watch, modern Patek. Uh, but I, I, I would have done a little touch there and there on the dial, especially on the fonts and the, the design of the dial, I, I would have done it kind of different. Uh, the case, just a couple of little things to make it a little more uh, subtle. But yeah, it's, I, I will take my favorite watch and try to make it better. And now, speaking of Grail watches, um, what would your hypothetical ideal Patek be if you had access to anything ever made? It, it, to, to own and keep, not as an investment. To right. Own and so work. it's kind of funny because it's two watches and they're sold at auction on the same auction. And it's uh, the JB Champion and the uh, Platinum 2499, which was Eric Clapton's watch. Uh, with those two, I'm a happy camper. Outstanding. And finally, for our friends online, where can they find you? Uh, Messinalab.com, M A S S E N A L A B.com. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.